four of the toppled train cars, this is all that's left, twisted in mangled metal. The convoy had just rolled onto the bridge when suddenly the center of the train plunged into the creek. Workers were called in immediately to start clearing the track. The men will be working night and day, first to get the train off the quarter mile of torn road bed, and then to reconstruct the railroad track. They say it'll be at least three days before the track will be usable, and that's an optimistic guess. The cars were full of corn on their way to Quanah, Texas. Thousands of dollars worth of the golden kernels will never make it. They lie instead here in Altus, in mounds covering several hundred feet. But transportation officials say almost 50% of the corn is salvageable. The cause of the derailment hasn't been determined. Railroad investigators are looking into three possibilities, a faulty train, a faulty bridge, or engineer error. Evidence is leaning towards a faulty bridge. The wooden structure was built in the 30s, and this year's heavy rains and high floodwaters haven't been kind. Railroad officials aren't happy that their track is out of commission, but they're pleased no one was injured. Sherry Sellers, Action 4 in Altus. The money is loaned by the bank. They charge the regular rate of interest. They service the loan. SBA gets in it only in that we guarantee the bank up to 90% of, of what the loan amount was. And SBA's 90% guarantee cannot exceed over $500,000. We will process those things as, as quickly as possible at, uh, depending on, on the number of uh, applications that, that we get uh, in this situation. Uh, at any rate, uh, it, it will be not, not exceed 10 days from the date that we receive from the bank a completed loan application. I'm Bella Shaw. Doug Dixon is back at home with his parents after spending his first night in his own bed in a month. His parents described him as tired and a bit nervous, to be expected of a child who supposedly has been living out of a car for the last month at a park in Tulsa. It was this park in Oklahoma City where Doug disappeared from. Okay, now, so one seldom sees unattended children in the park. If it happened to Doug Dixon, it could happen to any 10-year-old. And while Doug Dixon is at home, his life is still far from normal, as now he must undergo extensive questioning by the police and district attorney's office. Day one of the questioning has begun. Doug's parents, Ross and Peggy Dixon, took him to the police station and patiently awaited his questioning by officers in the juvenile division. While they waited, Ross Dixon talked about Doug's first night at home. Basically, we got home about 6 o'clock in the morning. And I fell asleep fairly fast. And, and Doug, of course, conked out, as well as Peggy. Phone started ringing about 8 o'clock, so that was short live. But Doug slept all the way till 1 o'clock. But the Dixons didn't have to wait long. Police only questioned Doug about an hour. There's really not much they can do until the suspects arrive in town. The alleged abduction case still has a long way to go. Police want to see what the medical report has to say to see for sure if any sexual abuse was involved. They, they still believe Doug was taken against his will. Bella Shaw, Action 4 at the Oklahoma City Police Department.
local police had been waiting for was brought in first. The man identified as 24-year-old Oscar Johnson. He's been a suspect since day two of the investigation. The two men who had first been called witnesses followed behind. It's now been determined that they were accomplices. The two have been identified as 18-year-old Leland Frank Fondo and 18-year-old Ronald Douglas. All three were taken upstairs to the booking room where they were searched and booked on charges of kidnapping. The two who have just been connected with the case were placed in the holding tank. But Oscar was led down the hall to closed door questioning by Juvenile Bureau investigators. The session turned up new information. It is not Oscar Johnson, as first alleged. His uh, name is uh, Robert Luther Hatcher Jr. And he's wanted out of Jackson, Michigan for escaping prison on a charge of conduct, uh, sexual misconduct in the first degree involving a juvenile, which is basically the same thing we have him, have him on in Oklahoma City. He, he did indicate his involvement with the Dixon boy. Uh, beyond that, uh, we have no further comment involving any uh, participation by any other party until we terminate uh, interviews with them tomorrow. Okay. And when you say involvement, you mean sexual involvement? Absolutely. Yes. There are still many unanswered questions concerning the disappearance of Doug Dixon and the involvement of the three suspects. Scott Wallace was in Tulsa and has this background report on the number one suspect, Robert Luther Hatcher Jr., alias Oscar Johnson. Twenty-nine Oklahoma banks, smaller than the Penn Square Bank, purchased loans from the defunct Oklahoma City Institution. That information was released in a copyright story in today's Tulsa Tribune. Usually when a bank wants to service a large loan, but the note is over the legal amount they can lend, the bank will secure a participation loan with another bank. They can pool their resources and lend large amounts of money while staying within the guidelines of the law. This way, banks can keep large investors happy without sacrificing service. This is a common practice in the banking industry. Bank officials say there is no reason to believe any of these smaller banks are in danger because they participated in loans arranged by Penn Square. This is Bill Smith. He works at Midwest National Bank in Midwest City. And like most bankers with dealings at Penn Square, he foresees no problems from the loans. No, I don't feel like there's any problem with that. Uh, then again, you've got to look at your individual deal on its own merits. Uh, if you're involved in a participation in one of the companies out there that uh, is having trouble, now you might have some trouble. Of the 29 Oklahoma banks involved with participation loans with the defunct Penn Square Bank, only one has come under the scrutiny of the FDIC. The Bank of Hilton had more than $7 million in participation loans with Penn Square. And a major stockholder of the Hilton Bank, former Penn Square chairman, Bill Jennings. In Midwest City, Kurt Autry, Action 4. One of the players in this pickup basketball game has just appeared in a national magazine. No, it's not Sports Illustrated, it's Playboy. This month's issue features girls of the Big Eight, and Angela Delosier, a freshman at OU, was selected. Angela really likes basketball. She was a guard on the Choctaw High School team that went to the state finals a few years ago. Angela was Miss Teen Oklahoma in 1980, but she says appearing in Playboy is special because it's supposed to show the most beautiful women in the world. So I really felt good about it. How have your family and friends reacted? Well, my mom and dad and everything, they were the ones that really encouraged me most to get into it. My sister, too, and my brother, they're the ones that told me to do it and talked me into it because I said, no, I don't want to do that because I won't make it, and they're the ones that talked me into it. To get away from it all, Angela likes to play with her pets. She's taking her dog, Monique, to obedience school. What are you doing? Is it hot outside? Huh? Yeah. And she also trains a horse in Choctaw. But at her home, there are more exotic pets like Ben the Rat and this hog-nosed bull snake. 
He scares a lot of people because you stick your hand there and he acts like he's going to strike. He spreads out his neck real big like a cobra. He makes a real weird hissing noise. He looks poisonous, but he's not. Pets are Angela's hobby, but her real ambitions are acting and modeling. And after meeting Angela, it would be hard to imagine any smart producer shutting the door on her. Bill Ross, Action 4, in Northwest Oklahoma City. The history of Vietnam is one of a long and unceasing struggle for an independent and free nation, a struggle in which America fought and died for. America watched and suffered as communism overtook all of Vietnam. And in search for their freedom, many of the Vietnamese fled their homeland and settled in America. Now, seven years later, the Vietnamese refugees are working for liberation. The fear that forced them from their homeland has not caused them to forget that land. Around the world, a Vietnamese movement is gaining strength, the National United Front for the Liberation of Vietnam. Today, supporters of the movement rallied in Oklahoma City. The group hopes to politically oust the communist regime in Vietnam. The overseas commissioner of the movement says with assurance that communism will fall. If the determination of our 50 million people inside and if the determination to support from the people of enemy people outside, we will come to the final victory. And this final victory will may, may come in three years, in five years, or maybe 10 years. But we will surely come and we will surely win. The movement is two years old and is five to 10,000 people strong in Vietnam alone. These Vietnamese, because they are free, say they have the power to guide their homeland from communism to democracy. Debbie Mash, Action 4. because here we are opposed to a Catholic state. Arafat is not the wholesomest guy. His looks is not the nicest, nor is he the greatest intellectual. He is not a Thomas Jefferson. But by God, he is a Patrick Henry. He's a patriot. He wants the right of his people to return to their land, and that should receive the support of all Americans. Of course, the economy in Oklahoma was very strong uh, throughout 80 and 81. And now, uh, of course, we have a certain amount of deterioration. It's, it's connected with two things, of course, the national recession, which spills over into some uh, industries in Oklahoma, and the recent uh, market slump in oil and gas. Uh, we've had a, a major drop in the number of rigs active in the state, uh, although we still show... On July 1st, 10-month-old Kelly Overstreet was pulled from water in a wading pool just a few inches deep. Firemen said she had been underwater for several minutes. That brought to light questions about the supervision at the daycare home. The daycare home was run by Helga Benson, who had her license taken away in 1975. We called her and asked her why she continued to keep children, but she would not talk to us. 
Well, of course, that's tragic, and you know we're deeply upset with, in the department that a young child has died. Child welfare uh, officials at the Department of Human uh, Services said they will to go to court Wednesday to see about closing the home. Uh, however, by providing care for any child, she was violating uh, uh, the Licensing Act of the state of Oklahoma. Uh, and had we known she was providing care, we might have tried to take uh, other action. But uh, tragically, uh, it came to our attention uh, when a child was hurt. Everybody on the back. Why? Because it's nap time. Meantime, other daycare operators hope the Benson case won't cast a bad light on them. There are a lot of daycare centers in the area that are reputable. We're all licensed and uh, the licensing department comes in and checks us regularly and uh, it does kind of give daycare a bad name when something like this happens. But I certainly hope that people do not judge us by what happened. Under the law, daycare centers must be licensed by both the city and the state. Stringent guidelines and numerous fire and health and safety codes are enforced. Child welfare workers make frequent visits to the centers to see that the children are cared for properly. The law requires a certain number of adults per child. And in Mrs. Benson's case, it has been reported that she was taking care of as many as 10 children when she should have had only five. Bella Shaw, Action 4 in Northwest Oklahoma City. Finding the cure or control to leukemia. The research and testing is expensive. $25 million will be spent nationally this year in leukemia research. Some $30,000 will be spent on leukemia research here in Oklahoma. The state leukemia chapter is receiving money from a new grant, money that brings the state closer in becoming one of the leaders in leukemia research. Uh, the new funds make available the fact that different areas of research can take place. Uh, it's frightening to think that there is the one person out there that has the answer to leukemia or relative cancer ailments that would not have the funds to study and to do the experiments that are needed. Gobin says now that research is available, Oklahoma could contribute a cure to the deadly disease. Debbie Mash, Action 4. I got a hundred two. I have a hundred dollar bill, two to buy two, two to two, two to a hundred and a half. I have a hundred and a quarter, a hundred and a half. I have a hundred. More than $1.5 million worth of used oil field equipment went on the trading block at Hilton Inn West today. The machinery on sale comes from about nine oil companies that have gone out of business or have filed for bankruptcy. But these oil men are solvent, and they're here to get a good buy. 100 watt. Three and a quarter, three and a half, three and a half, three and a half, three and a half, anybody with three and a half and 75. Nelson International, a Texas-based auctioneering firm, is sponsoring today's auction, largely for the central drilling company in Meeker, which has gone out of business. Another big seller today is the First National Bank and Trust of Oklahoma City. They have an entire rig that they've repossessed, which initially cost them more than $750,000. Not everyone here can afford a half million dollars worth of oil equipment. And according to the head of the auction company, some of these men are thankful to still be in business. They're in a tough situation, you know, even if they 
you know, we're in good shape with the bank and the bank has gone under, you know, with their collateral and now they're forced to go somewhere else for loans and, and they don't have any collateral to do it with. So it's put them in a really tough spot at a particularly tough time in the in the industry too. So it's they're going to have to do something and the easiest way for some of them is to convert their assets into cash. This is the first big oil equipment auction since the collapse of the Penn Square Bank. And although auction officials say they don't see too many former Penn customers here, they admit that liquidations of assets at auctions like these may be the only way out for many. Kurt Autry, Action 4. And there was simply no way that the school district felt like that they could take the responsibility for dividing that $300,000 up among the children. Some of the children are represented by attorneys. Uh, some lawsuits have been filed. And several of the children are not represented. And lawsuits have not been filed. So what the school district wanted to do was to make sure that all of the children got a chance to get some money out of this $300,000 fund. All I heard was whoo, and I seen lights fly off and hit the bottom road. And when it did, I seen it flip about two, three times, and then no lights whatsoever. And my headlights happened to catch one of the guys bouncing off the ground and just laying there. It scared the daylights out of me, especially when he come down not 20, 30 feet in front of me. It scared the daylights out of me. More police confirmed today that 25-year-old Philip Ray Carini was shot after allegedly stabbing two more police officers in a tag agency. Police say Carini was from Laguna Beach, California. He came to Moore a week before the incident. Carini was fatally shot by Officer Gerald Bolin after stabbing Bolin in the neck and critically wounding his partner, Detective Gary Tips. Tips remains in stable condition at South Community Hospital. To shoot or not to shoot is the controversy. And today, the Moore police are feeling the pressure from several eyewitnesses who say that Officer Bolin should have never fired the four fatal shots in a room full of people. Charles Melton was at the tag agency when the shots were fired. He was hit, and I saw him struggling to the door. And when he got to the door, he was trying to get out when Bolin walked up with his gun and fired three shots into his back. Do you think it was necessary for him to fire those shots to apprehend that uh, I don't suspect? I don't believe it was necessary to fire any shots inside that, that little bitty room in there with 20 or 25 people in that room. I think the matter could have been taken care of outside when the gentleman walked outside because there's only one door in and one door out. And I, I believe it was just a rookie 
mistake. But more police sergeant David Bender doesn't feel that way. Bender is in charge of the investigation, and he believes Officer Bolin acted properly. After a police officer's been stabbed and another police officer's been stabbed twice, with the danger to the citizens in that room, the officer used the judgment that he felt was necessary to take care of the situation. But was it customary procedure? Uh, to, to be honest with you, it's the first time a police officer's ever had to uh, shoot, a, shoot a person and cause his death in the city of Moore. So as far as customary procedure, I couldn't say yes and I can't say no. An executive police review board will examine all the facts today here at the Moore Police Department. They'll make a recommendation as to who they think was right or wrong in the incident. But regardless of their findings, a lot of questions remain unanswered as to exactly what happened last Friday. Kurt Autry, Action 4, Moore. The most recent sewage rate hike in Moore came nearly 20 years after the last one. In that time, Moore has grown, the economy has changed, and the city started losing money on sewage treatment. Simple economics required a change. That change shocked some Moore residents whose bills jumped from $2 to $18 in one month. They gathered at the weekly council meeting to let the city know that while a rate hike was needed, the new system wasn't fair. Of all the complaints that I've had, nobody has complained about the sewer rate increase. They're just complaining about the way it was done, and I agree with you. Now we just have to find out which is the fairest way for everybody to go. For the, the council decided unanimously to restudy the new system and take the issue up again at the next meeting. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4, in more. By looking at the amount of voters at this precinct, you probably wouldn't think this was a city council election. Ward 4 residents poured into voting places to cast their ballots for a new city councilman. Usually council races have a low voter turnout. Many of these people had voted in the first Ward 4 election held last May. It was declared invalid after one candidate learned some of the voters didn't even live in Ward 4. Poll workers say they are making sure that mistake doesn't happen this time. The May election results unofficially declared Pete White the winner by 86 votes. White says he thinks the outcome will be the same today. His opponent, R.G. Bob McKillops, feels his campaigning for today's election will put him in the seat vacated by Bill Bishop last March. The polls will stay open until 7 p.m. Ed Stewart, Action 4 in southwest Oklahoma City. You probably wouldn't think taking a bus to downtown Oklahoma City from Edmond would be a big deal. But in June, the Edmond City Council voted to end its contract with COTPA, the Central Oklahoma Transportation and Parking Authority. The city said it was just too expensive to keep subsidizing the bus route. But bus passengers don't want to lose the service. They met with COTPA officials at Edmond City Hall to discuss alternative ways to keep the buses rolling. COTPA officials told the bus riders the best way to continue service and to make sure they got a bus in good condition was to form a bus club. Then the club would make a deal with COTPA. And you would enter into contract with COTPA for um, the service to provide the service when you wanted it and for how long and what type of bus you wanted it, anything of this nature. And then we would sign the contract with the board's approval for this and then you would begin service. And basically, and then at the end of the month, we would charge you for half of the cost of the service. The federal government would pay the other half. So if a club is formed, and if enough passengers take the bus, Edmund riders would actually pay less than they do now. Bill Ross, Action 4. Of dedicated on the, the date of the crash, which is the anniversary of the crash, which is August 15th. But who designed the Will Rogers Commission, the Diamond Jubilee Commission, the Oklahoma Historical Society, 
but a lot of funds are being raised. On August the 15th, 1935, the crash that was heard around the world occurred outside, outside of Point Barrow, Alaska, and took the life of two Oklahomans, Will Rogers and Wiley Post. Today we are participating in a dedication of a memorial that will be dedicated in Point Barrow this August the 15th, 47 years later. And the Oklahoma citizens, encouraged by the Will Rogers Commission and the Historical Society, and the Claremore Lions Club and the Point Barrow Lions Club have raised funds and are still raising funds to dedicate a new monument 47 years later in honor of those two people.